2023 the best year in gaming? For many, the answer seems simple. Yes! With so many amazing games released throughout the year, how couldn't it be? Unfortunately, it's anything but simple. Because the question itself doesn't make sense. And when you add in context, the question becomes horrifying. Think about it. What does the best year in gaming even mean? What are we comparing? What are we using to base our judgment? What's the criteria? Maybe it's just purely the quality of games released. After all, that shined best in 2023, but 2007 might take the cake instead. This year, we witnessed the next decade be paid for the gaming industry as many of the biggest franchises started. Mass Effect, The Witcher, Assassin's Creed all released their first games this year, and although they were all overshadowed by their sequels, the first games were amazing and revolutionary at the time. They went on to make so many sequels because of these games' success. However, Green of Souls, they have not aged well. Portal also released alongside them and invented a new type of puzzle game that has since inspired countless games, and Portal has aged beautifully. Not to mention Super Mario Galaxy, which is the best standalone 3D Mario game, Fight Me, which showed off Mario without any fancy doodads, just good platforming, sometimes in zero gravity. Many of the games launched this year are the most praised of their franchise, but not all. Regardless, without 2007, gaming undeniably wouldn't be where it is. Not because of innovation, but because of the trends started by purely amazing games. However, there weren't that many certified slaps released overall. The list is small. So if we're instead going to look at the quantity of quality, which would also shine in 2023, then maybe 2004 would be the better year to compare. Many of the games launched were reviewed extremely high for the time and are still praised today. According to a study done by Spades Challenge, 2004 is in second place for the highest reviewed year of all time, right behind 2003. However, in my research, I've seen more people today praise 2004. My theory is that these games survived the test of time better than 2003's, so this year is better for us. The list of bangers is essentially endless. We could talk on length for majority of these games and the effects they had on the industry afterward. Once again, not because of innovation, but because of quality, trends, and how they set a lot of our preferences for games going forward. But I don't wanna, that seems like a boring video. Instead, let's focus on two of the games, Katamari Damacy and Cave Story. Still need to play that one. These two games are examples of early indies that helped kick off the golden age of indies, which started with the Xbox 360's launch, and frankly, we're still in today, and that wouldn't have started without hits like these. Although every one of the games I've spoken about so far has had an effect on the future, it's mostly just because of their quality within their specific genre. Maybe good games aren't enough to call a year the best, but rather it has to do with the influence games or consoles had on the industry as a whole. Enough to call the year impactful because of the technology they pioneered or innovated and the wave that followed. By far the most pointed to year for this is 1998 for a few reasons. The first is it being the year of my birth and that alone had a huge impact on the gaming space. The second is Ocarina of Time. Now I believe that people give it a little too much credit, but it did do a lot of firsts. The open world with different biomes and styles was new for the time and massive by those standards. And the controls were tighter than anything out of the time. Namely because of the introduction of Z-targeting, which has since been utilized by nearly every third-person game since. It showed what was possible on the N64 while also having a good story with rememberable characters. All the while, Nintendo was also launching the Game Boy Color with Pokemon Red and Blue, which started the single biggest franchise in the world and showed what was possible on the Game Boy Color. Nintendo had a hell of a year, but Sony wasn't stepping down either with Metal Gear Solid, where Hidoyo Kojimbo showed off a massive open world rivaling that of, of Ocarina of Time, all while bridging the gap between video games and movies with cinematic cutscenes that have since become the norm. On PC, Valve released Half-Life, which introduced a new game engine that would soon become the most popular engine on the platform due to its revolutionary physics, and of course started Valve's journey to take over the PC market using Steam. There also were a bunch of other video games that all did amazing things within their genres. While PlayStation and Nintendo were shooting off at all cylinders, Sega was getting the absolute shit beat out of them. Which leads into 2001, the next year people often point to for its impact on the industry. Sega fucking died! Or at least their console did. 
which caused them to leave the console market entirely, which surely caused some layoffs. In its place, the Xbox was born, which invented online gaming and multiplayer on a console, primarily with their new sci-fi FPS, Halo. Using the foundation set by GoldenEye and Perfect Dark, Halo truly showed what an FPS on consoles could be. Nintendo also launched the Game Boy Advance and the GameCube. The GameCube launched with Super Smash Bros. Melee, using the 64 games as a base, and created an entirely new kind of fighting game. One that many still praise as the best fighting game ever made. All of that's baby shit though. The real influence was on PlayStation. Rockstar released Grand Theft Auto 3 and reinvented the open world genre, which previously had its trend set by Zelda. By becoming more sandboxy and allowing the players to solve missions in creative ways, which in turn made open world become the standard for all AAA devs going forward, and has since been mimicked by many of those released, most recently Tears of the Kingdom and Baldur's Gate 3. On top of that, Devil May Cry refined and defined the hack and slash genre, and Jack and Daxter showed a lot of innovations from early Naughty Dog, which would be adopted by many cinematic games going forward, primarily utilizing in-engine cinematics to remove loading screens. Plus, once again, a ton of other games that defined a generation and led to a bigger and greater things. But if you want to really get into the nitty gritty, neither 1998 or 2001 is the most impactful year. That goes to 1985 easily. In 1983, gaming died due to crappy games flooding the market, mostly made by inexperienced devs or people just trying to make a quick buck. On top of that, there were way too many consoles on the market which splintered the user base, with some studios even putting out more than one at a time. E.T. put the nail in the coffin and gaming outside of Japan was long buried, literally. Two years later, Nintendo put out the NES, which revived gaming, and they launched Mario, which created the composite genre, a singular game that fluidly meshes two genres into one product by swapping back and forth between the focal points. Most games took that format until they became so complicated that now they have like 20 genres. So as you can see, gaming wouldn't exist without 1985. So you could say it's the most impactful a year can be for the gaming industry. This is why impact and influence are a dangerous conversation. It's extremely easy to worship the elders while ignoring the newer years, which is why most people point to 1998 as the best year in gaming without acknowledging any others. Very recently, we've seen a lot of impactful years in gaming, like in 2013 when both the PS4 and Xbox One launched. The Xbox One flopped hardcore, which led to Game Pass existing. The best deal in gaming, please pay me Microsoft. I need the money and I use your service all the time and I love it and I advertise it, please pay me. And the PS4 launched with The Last of Us, which has since become the biggest game franchise behind Pokemon. GTA 5 is still selling like hotcakes and unfortunately created the foundation for a future live service game. And Assassin's Creed 4, the best pirate game to date, fight me. Meanwhile, Nintendo's Wii U was struggling hardcore, which crawled so that the Switch could sprint in 2017. Often overshadowed by the year after, 2017 was way more impactful and had a lot of great games too. The Switch launch with Breath of the Wild, which changed the open world genre so much that it became a new genre. I have a video about it, you can watch it by clicking right there. Splatoon 2, which should have had a free to play version. And Super Mario Odyssey, the third best 3D Mario game behind Galaxy and Bowser's Fury, fight me. The Switch alone is enough to make this year one of the most impactful years in my eyes at least. It changed what it meant to be a console and will most likely become the best selling one by the end of its lifetime, assuming the Switch 2 is coming. Which has yet to be confirmed by the time of this video, but hey, maybe when you're watching it, it's confirmed. Is it cool? Is it good? Let me know, is it good? And that's not even the end. On PC, Sonic Mania was released, showing that Sonic still got it, and Resident Evil 7 revived the franchise and brought it back to its roots, reinventing survival horror all over again with help from PT. Thanks, Hadoobu, Kujubu. And perhaps most importantly, both PUBG and Fortnite launched, not only starting the Battle Royale trend, but also making live service gaming a desired trait, taking what GTA 5 did and refining it. If only I could go back in time. Also personal, but Hollow Knight launched and I like that game, that's pretty cool. So while it's important to respect where we came from, don't discount the years that came after for what they did for the industry too, when answering the question of the best year in gaming. Speaking of, let's return to the titular question, was 2023 the best year in gaming? There is no denying that there are tons of great games, from big ones like Tears of the Kingdom, Final Fantasy 16, Alan Wake 2, Spider-Man 2, 
Baldur's Gate 3, and many more, to the indies like Ready or Not, Lies of P, Dredge, Pizza Tower, Gunbrella, Dave the Diver, and many more. Just keeping you on your toes, that's not an indie game. Even DLC popped off this year, with Phantom Liberty and Valhalla being the Prime 2 examples. So if the criteria you prefer is about great games, or the amount of great games, then 2023 is a massive contender. And were actually too many good games this year? Please slow down. When it comes to impact, it's kind of impossible to truly know the effect these games will have on the gaming industry until it happens. I mean, we can take guesses. Baldur's Gate 3 will probably make devs put a further emphasis on choice and maybe change the way they handle NPC conversations, making them utilize the camera more. Final Fantasy 16 might bring in more action to series that were previously turn-based, kind of already has. Phantom Liberty might make them more willing to put out unfinished games and fix them later, even though other games fight back against that claim. But again, they're just guesses. Let me know what you think the best year in gaming is in the comments below, whether you've lived through it or not. But most importantly, share why you think that year is the best by using the criteria you've heard in this video, or your own, because context changes the conversation. Thank you for watching- Wait, 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 the video isn't over! What? There's more they need to know! The video isn't over? Context! Oh, I get it. No, 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 no! We can't see the impact these games will have on the gaming industry until it happens. That's true. I didn't lie to you, I swear. But the games aren't the only part of the equation. We have more context. So the conversation has changed. The gaming industry is a lot more than just the games released. There are developers, publishers, press, and more, and all of these are people. And without those people, there would be no games, only bacon. In 2023 alone, there have been over 10,000 layoffs within gaming. Now those aren't exact numbers, there's not actually a way to track something like this accurately. It's like an estimate. This includes indie devs like those who launched Palia, and big ones like Microsoft, which hit Bethesda and 343, or Unity, who of course did so after making horrible decisions. There are two big standouts among the many, 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 many layoffs that occurred though, as they're both the most egregious in reason. Epic Games with 800 people pointing to bad investments, and Embracer, who acquired many studios and IPs, but then had a $2 billion deal fall through with Saudi Arabia's game initiative, Savvy Games Group, causing them to close veteran studios, cancel games, and lay off 900 people. Now, of course, the pandemic is the main reason overall. We saw a massive increase in tech sales because players had much more time to spare for gaming. These frankly short-sighted studios saw this as an opportunity to expand to the point that was unsustainable when the market has now begun stabilizing. The cost of these poor investments, of course, doesn't fall on the higher ups that made the decisions it falls on the workers. The executives are still making millions, sometimes billions, completely ignoring Satoru Iwata's moves in 2013, where he and other Nintendo executives took massive pay cuts following the Wii U's crawl so that they could avoid layoffs. Job security at Nintendo is the primary reason their games are as good as they are. Many of the people making these franchises have been doing so for decades. They prioritize people over profit. So those people will be happy and in turn make good games that will make a profit. They did this before in 2011 too when the 3DS had a price drop. To make matters worse, some of the layoffs are handled horribly, which only adds insult to injury. Some companies are completely transparent. They warn that layoffs are coming far ahead of time, they give decent and true reasons, and when they do eventually hit, the morale for all employees, both fired and remaining, is much less negative than it would be for the alternative. Other companies, like Epic, for example, spring these layoffs on the employees by having unlabeled meetings, group chat shutdowns, and keycards suddenly not working, and, you know, other sneaky methods. This causes panic, which hurts both morale and the mental health for, once again, every employee, not just the ones who lost their job. Look at this cute doggy! Aww! Aren't they so cute? We've been talking serious for a really long time. I wanted to break it up. Who's a little cutie? You are. You are. Look at you. Aww. Okay, okay. We, just get out of here. We had our fill. We had our fill. Okay. 
back to Sirius. Sometimes, and way more often than you'd think, this takes place directly after a long period of crunch. So the employees are working super hard overtime shifts, neglecting their health and home lives just to be fired the moment it ends. It feels like a betrayal. Like the company doesn't respect their workers because they don't. And we can see that from the, the publicly too. What? We can see that public. We can see, we can see it. Okay, I've read a lot of words. Okay, I've, I, this is a long video for me. I'm trying my best. Press the like button. <laughs> Back to Epic Games, who then later held an Unreal Fest with massive success, and then just a few months after, had Fortnite see the highest player count it's ever had. These kinds of celebrations make you wonder why the layoffs happened, and it disrespects those they lost immensely. Immortals of Avium didn't sell well, we all know that. Some of you might not have even heard about the game until right now, but in the grand scheme, that doesn't matter. Hasbro, for example, laid off the bulk of the team that made Baldur's Gate 3, and that's 2023's game of the year. Even loyalty at a company doesn't make you safe. Some of these layoffs are of 20-year veterans at, like, at BioWare who are now suing for receiving lesser severance. Worst of all, worse than thousands of layoffs that are still happening in 2024, these companies aren't losing much. Every year, there is some big gaming news story that is constantly getting updated as the year goes on. Uh, for 2022, that news story was NFTs, which fortunately has started to die off as we, the gamers, have shamed the majority of studios out of using the technology that functionally serves no real purpose right now. So in 2023, they're mostly dead. Except for Square Enix, who refuses to submit despite having every reason to. Something needed to replace NFTs in the news cycle, and although the Activism Blizzard acquisition was ever present, and ended in layoffs, a greater evil took the storm. And evil even stronger than NFTs, because this evil has a lawful good purpose, a useful function, but is corrupted by greed. AI. At its base, AI is an incredibly useful tool that helps creators by cutting out the boring, monotonous work that creation often requires. And in a way, it's been present in gaming for decades as procedural generation is technically a form of AI. In reality, this tech should be called progenitive generation. It's a more accurate name, but whatever, man. I guess iRobot was chopped liver. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Who? 1999 Disney Original Smart House? Who? As the technology has become more advanced, namely in 2023, it has transformed into a horrible money printing machine, but all the money doesn't look quite right. AI utilizes a database of examples to pull from to mimic and guesstimate what the user wants to pump out. For art, which is the most forward-facing use of this tech, the AI scans a database of pictures and specified art styles to then shit out something. Most related to art, AI is a marketing tool, meaning that studios like Microsoft, for, you know, just a random example, utilize AI-generated art to market their events and games, which is screwed up. AI voice acting is also pretty prevalent, where an AI analyzes a voice to then translate it into text-to-speech system, like seen in the finals, or by the people who recorded your voice on that spam call you picked up for. This is also screwed up, partially because people do this without the actor's consent. Looking at you streamers with the text-to-speech of famous characters, but also because it cuts the actor out of the equation of the creative process and introduces yet another method for them to be underpaid for their work. Not to mention that the AI voice is great at doing the voice, but really bad at acting. But probably the first employees to go when it comes to AI are the writers. And AI isn't going to replace Dan Hauser at Rockstar or anything, but the writers that make the fluff dialogue for random NPCs are in rapid danger. Ubisoft is already working on a tool that replaces them. They claim that the writers are still needed in the equation, but it changes their job from creative writing to multiple choice. And that seems monotonous as hell, and no writer wants to do that. Plus, it makes their job even more entry level than it was adding more people into the job pool, which makes getting a position even more difficult. And that, unfortunately, brings us back to layoffs. AI has the potential to be an amazing tool to support creators, but instead it's utilized in a life-destroying way because AI is quicker and cheaper than laid-off employees 
and it doesn't complain. So now there are thousands of untrained and talented employees flooding the job market, all on the search for their next home, while an AI is threatening the very possibility of that home and the competition is intense. One Sega employee stated that they've applied to over 600 jobs in just eight months. And many others share similar stories. A lot of these people have the same roles at these companies too. The same branches being laid off across the industry like community management or quality insurance, which are both viewed as entry level and in turn are underpaid and underappreciated. And of course, of course, I'd be remiss to not mention that women LGBTQ and other marginalized groups are often impacted way more than others as well. Now, a little clarification on the layoffs I just talked about. As I said earlier, we don't have specific data. We don't know for a fact that those branches and stuff are being hit, but people talk. And many are now pushing for unionization because even though it wouldn't stop the layoffs from occurring, it would bring proper severance and compensation when they do happen and, of course, help with the job hunt. Currently, the systems in place have a tight chokehold on the industry, so it's an upward battle. We all should agree with Iwata, people over profit, but a union might be needed to force that movement. Alongside the massive layoffs and the threat of AI, not every game in 2023 has been a bang. While we've had the greats like Baldur's Gate 3 or Spider-Man 2, we've also had the struggles of other games like Redfall, which launched not only buggy and unoptimized, but just straight up unfinished. Now, they vow that they're going to fix it and make Redfall a good game. I point to Cyberpunk, which made them think that that was acceptable and say, I'd rather them move on. Star Wars Jedi Survivor was a really good game, but it ran horribly off launch with EA taking the we'll make it better approach, just like they did with Fallen Order. And probably the most egregious was the day before, which was one of the most wishlisted games on Steam until it launched as barely even a game, making it seem like majority of those wishlists were bots. The studio then quickly shuttered its doors, delisted the game, and shut down the servers, and then keys popped up for hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars. Where did those keys come from? Now, many people, me included, look at the day before as a scam. But regardless, something is true for all three of these games and the other poor launches of the year. They think this is okay, and they keep getting away with it. Online gaming, which Xbox founded, was originally an amazing thing that allowed us to connect to other players using our favorite hobby. And it allowed for game-breaking bugs to be fixed. A million players will always find more than the 100-person QA team ever could. But it has since been abused by these studios to use as an excuse for releasing unfinished games, which is not okay. And we have seen prime examples of this in 2030, 2023. What year is it? I made a video about this a while ago, but I don't really like it very much because I was honestly wrong in it a few times. We need to stop pre-ordering games, and we need to stop praising devs like CD Projekt Red for fixing the broken games that shouldn't have been busted in the first place. This entire year of great games but horrible turmoil was then end-capped by the biggest spit in the face. At the Game Awards, the biggest show of the year for the industry, where all corners come together for one reason, games. Developers went out to accept their awards for their amazing games just to be pushed off the stage in 30 seconds not allowing them to think who they want to think, making it so the Game of the Year winner had to post their speech on Twitter rather than allowing them to say it on the biggest stage the industry has. And truly, it's ridiculous and shouldn't be... Wait, why is the music getting louder? I'm not finished yet! I'm not finished yet! Stop! I'm not finished! Let me finish! Thank you for watching. If you want more, click the thingy. But more importantly, subscribe. You clearly liked the video. I mean, you're still here and it's the end. It helps a ton. I love you. Mwah!